Good evening. My name is John Buckman, and I serve as Director of Development at the Lumen Christi Institute. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's event. Lumen Christi was founded in 1997 by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago, and its mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a living dialogue partner at the University of Chicago and in our broader society through courses, lectures, summer seminars for graduate and undergraduate students and virtual events like these. Now, if you like tonight's webinar, I want to alert you to some of Lumen Christi's other upcoming events. Our final session of Catholics and Muslims, History, Theology, Encounters, a webinar series presented together with the Gusana Society will take place on September 8th at 6 p.m. And the theme is Francis and Francis Encountering Muslims Past and Present. And then on September 26th, we will have our final session in this series, The Christological Structure of Spiritual Growth in the Thought of St. Bernard, featuring Father Rock Koretsky. Tonight's event is the third of four summer sem webinars co-presented with Our Lady of Dallas Cistercian Abbey in Irving, Texas. In partnership with them, Lumen Christi aims to bring into focus the vibrant monastic intellectual tradition God is working to build up in their monastery, visible in their apostolate, Cistercian Preparatory School, and some of the monks who teach at the University of Dallas. The Summer Monastic Wisdom Series puts this on full display to a wider audience through this online format. I would like to thank our co-sponsors for this webinar series, including the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the St. Benedict Institute, and Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture at the University of Dallas. Now, if you appreciate our work and you'd like to see it grow, uh, you can support us in three ways. First, join our mailing list, follow Lumen Christi on social media, and share word about these events with others. Word of mouth remains the most effective means of inviting others into the Catholic intellectual tradition. Second, at the end of the event, you'll be invited to participate in a survey that will help Lumen Christi gauge what we are doing right and what needs improvement. By filling it out, uh, you'll enter a raffle to win a gift card to our favorite independent bookstore, The Seminary Co-op. And finally, you can support Lumen Christi financially by donating today to help the Institute to continue to put on events like these for free for viewers like you at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. During tonight's event, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. You can, however, post a question at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. In addition to questions being read by the moderator, we will also give voice to our audience to ask questions. Tonight's program is, is being recorded and will stream from our YouTube page and be posted to our website. So that it is easy for you to revisit the talk, a link is included in your confirmation email and will be shared tomorrow. I now have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished speaker. Father John Beyer entered Our Lady of Dallas Cistercian Abbey in August 2007 and made his solemn profession in 2012. He teaches English lab, Latin, and theology at Cistercian Preparatory School. He is also an adjunct professor of theology at University of Dallas. He received his doctorate from the Pontifical Gregorian University, where he defended his dissertation on St. Anselm of Canterbury in 2019. And now, Father John Beyer, thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen and we'll be off to the races. Okay. So my talk is the monastic before the scholastics, an introduction to medieval monastic theology and to its enduring value or its importance. I wanna begin in a little bit of a silly way. Uh, so the, the takeaway from my talk is ultimately that if you wanna be a real theologian or a good theologian, get thee to a nunnery. So uh, I'm only half kidding. The, the half kid part is that I'm not saying that everyone needs to follow Hamlet's advice and become a member of a canonical religious order. But I am saying that if what I'm trying to argue tonight is true, we must, in order to be good theologians or to think well about God, 
be willing to engage our spiritual lives as totally as a religious would or as a monk would. Um, the intellectual life is ultimately something that springs from our whole life. And if we think of theology with the Catholic tradition as fides querens intellectum, or as a living faith searching for understanding, uh, I think it's quite natural to recognize that our intellectual life is going to spring from a more comprehensive, integral life that we're living as spiritual people. Thinking itself is, of course, an integrally human act. And the more real our object that we're thinking about, the more integrally we must be prepared to think about it. So if you compare, for example, trying to know, say, some pure object of mathematics, something very abstract, you might be able to do that with a variety of existential commitments. But to be willing to know something like a person, you must be open not only in mind, but also in heart. And above all, to know something as real and concrete as the reality of God, we must even more be ready to engage ourselves existentially or integrally. So more concretely tonight, uh, besides the half kid from Hamlet, is uh, the following goals for my presentation. The first goal is to distinguish between monastic and scholastic theology. I imagine that will take maybe 20, 25 minutes. And then the second goal is to argue using St. Anselm of Canterbury as a witness for the necessity of the monastic moment in theology. Okay, the next uh, slide I'd like to present to you uh, to sort of provoke the discourse is this quotation from Balthazar. It's an observation he makes about the history of theology. He says, in the whole history of Catholic theology, there is hardly anything that is less noticed, yet more deserving of notice, than the fact that since the great period of scholasticism, there have been few theologians who were saints. If we consider the history of theology up to the time of the great scholastics, we are struck by the fact that the great saints were mostly great theologians. So Balthazar here is making a statement about more or less the first 1300 years of Catholic theology or theology from the beginning up to the period of the great scholastics, which for him is around the 13th century with such greats as Thomas Aquinas and St. Bonaventure. And he's arguing that it's extremely important, but for some reason we don't pay attention to the fact that the greatest theologians of the tradition were also saints. And many of the saints of the first millennium were themselves also theologians. And so there must be something important and intrinsic about this connection between the spiritual life well lived and our ability to think about God. Um, and he obviously is, is setting this in opposition to the period after great scholasticism, when theology, as it were, became exclaustrated or left the monastery or left the context of the religious life and ever more in modernity became an increasingly um, secularized uh, event. That is to say that theology was taking place at a university, which was as the centuries of modernity went forward, more and more professionalized and, and um, further removed from an explicitly confessional or ecclesial structure like the church. And so you could argue, uh, I think following Balthazar's read of the theological tradition, that uh, the intellectual life of the philosopher, the theologian searching for God, um, risked becoming uprooted from the existential soil that makes it fertile. Balthazar's uh, project was a lot um, centered on the trying to uh, inspire a kind of kneeling theology or an effort to reunite uh, prayer and thought. This way of doing theology, you know, uniting prayer and thought is, I think, in a nutshell, something that we could learn from the monastic theologians and from the first millennium of church fathers more broadly. When we read these theologians, I think one of the first things we come up against is the fact that these guys, they, they saw what they were talking about. Uh, the, the object of their discourse was of real relevance to their lives. Um, they weren't talking about mere abstractions. They were talking things about which they were panting afterward. Um, they, they had a sense for the reality of what they were talking about. Um, unlike today, where a lot of the times, I think one of the biggest criticisms people make of theology these days is that it sounds like it's just abstract. 
Uh, it sounds like the theologian or the philosopher is just trading in abstractions. Uh, we've lost touch so much with the reality of the objects of theology that a lot of people have no idea anymore what we're talking about when we speak about God. And thus many of the detractors of, of the Christian tradition, say like a Richard Dawkins or any of the new atheists, for example, think that what we're talking about when we talk about God is something like the flying spaghetti monster or some uh, being, some Superman-like creature for which there's no evidence, but we're saying he must have been there to push around the galaxies in their current formation. So these folks, um, unfortunately, are, are dialoguing with us with the impression that, um, or, or without any sense for what we are at least trying to talk about. So we've lost touch with the reality of God or at least we seem to, um, to those who are, are trying to dialogue with us. And I suggest that one of the reasons for that is that um, we sort of lost touch with the kind of life in which the reality of God is, is, quite, is quite clear. Okay, so what is monastic theology? Uh, my first effort to try to um, answer that question is to compare two texts in the theological tradition. Uh, the two texts are from Augustine and from Aquinas. Let me read the Augustine text for you now. You are my God, my life, my holy delight. But is this enough to say of you? Can any man say enough when he speaks of you? Yet woe betide those who are silent about you. Who will grant me to rest content in you? To whom shall I turn for the gift of your coming into my heart and filling it to the brim so that I may forget all the wrong I have done and embrace you alone, my only source of good? Why do you mean so much to me? Have pity on me and help me, O Lord, my God. Tell me why you mean so much to me. It's a very powerful uh, text, uh, very typical for Augustine and his restless heart. Um, you see very clearly the ego of the theologian, or that is his personal eye, his subjectivity coming out in his, uh, in his theology. It's quite clear that the reality of God is of, of absolute existential importance to him. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's clear how much God means to him. Augustine himself can't even figure out just how much it means, but it's clear to us that it means a lot. And so Augustine here is a first century author, he's a church father, you can also call him a monastic theologian. And I think this kind of a text is very typical of monastic theology. Uh, let's contrast that now with Aquinas, a great scholastic. This is Aquinas speaking about God. Uh, in the Summa. Now, it is not possible that the same thing should be at once in actuality and potentiality in the same respect. Therefore, whatever is in motion must be put in motion by another. But this cannot go on to infinity, because then there would be no first mover, and consequently no other mover, seeing that subsequent movers move only in as much as they are put in motion by the first mover. Therefore, it is necessary to arrive at a first mover, put in motion by no other. And this everyone understands to be God. It's very clear this is a different kind of text, a very different genre of writing we're dealing with here. Aquinas uh, is, is very conceptual, you could say objective, that is the ego of the theologian does not enter into this text um, in any apparent way, certainly not like it does in the text of Augustine. Uh, it appears even and it could be perceived as even detached from personal significance. At least there's no indication from this style of writing that what the man has just demonstrated is of sort of paramount importance to his life. Um, I think that you can describe the difference between these two texts using the language of Newman. Augustine is aiming at, you could say, a real apprehension. That is, and an apprehension of the reality of God before him in a way that moves him and that he really senses with his spiritual senses. And Aquinas is having, as it were, a notional apprehension. He's arriving at the reality of God by contrasting God with other, uh, with other beings, uh, other kinds of things. And it's in that contrast that he's developing certain notions that, that help him arrive at, at a proof of God. Now, um, I would, I would want to um, qualify that in so many ways, because uh, I don't want to say that uh, for the great scholastics like Aquinas, uh, there is absent a real apprehension of God. Um, some people would read this text and they would feel that Aquinas is just trading in abstractions. And uh, 
it's 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 not something that that they're moved by or convinced by. Um, I find Aquinas's arguments very convincing, and I think that one of the reasons for that could be that uh, I by trying to read the monks before him have come to some real apprehension that he must have had underlying what's going on here. But uh, nevertheless, I think the first reading of these two texts uh, yields very different responses. The monastic theology offers a language to express and interpret uh, the Christian spiritual life as it's concretely experienced. And the more you understand and read monastic theology, I think the more you understand your own spiritual life as a Christian. Um, and I think this is what makes the, the text so attractive. So uh, I've met many undergraduates who had the very same experience that I did when I first read the Confessions. You just fall in love with Augustine. Um, there's a man who's just laying it all out there. And you can follow him in the drama of sin and grace and freedom and the search for happiness and God. We, we know what he's talking about when he describes the pear tree and, and the temptation of sin and so forth. Um, the same thing happens, I think, to many people who read the homilies of St. Bernard. We can follow these saints as they read their own interior lives and discover that same reading in our own. And we can learn to name all the many elements of the landscape of, of our spiritual life. And that's very, um, that's very pleasant uh, and that's very consoling and helpful. The text from Aquinas, again, doesn't usually move people in the same way. Um, people are often very impressed by its logical clarity. Um, usually people don't have a problem with the logic itself, but they still come to the end and they remain kind of nonplussed and they're, they're not moved, wondering perhaps this is just an abstraction. They can't enter into Aquinas's arguments always with the kind of real apprehension or the sense for the concrete purchase of his language on reality that would then make them moved by the conclusion. But again, I think that there is such a real apprehension lying underneath. I think there is something like a philosophical mysticism here. I think you can, you know, to say it, I guess, simply like go out into the forest and hold a leaf and be really moved by the insight into contingent being and through that mirror to absolute being and, um, and, and be moved by that and not just have it exist as a, as a pure abstraction, as it were. But in any event, um, it's clear that there's a difference between these texts. Uh, and here's a kind of fun slide, so just to be a little silly. Um, this is a way of, I think, presenting an image form, the difference between these two bodies of literature. So on, the, on one side, we've got a very cute doggy who clearly sees something. So that dog has, you know, in the way that an animal can, a kind of real apprehension of something, and it's desiring it. And so it's like a deer that yearns for running streams. So my soul longs for you, my God. Uh, in that experience of, of, of the deer, uh, we can find, I think, the monastic theologian. And then on the other side of the screen, we have, um, you know, the, the notional apprehension. This, you know, the construction of ideas through the comparison of different objects. And uh, we can follow the logic all the way up to, you know, the form of the good. Uh, but at the end of the day, a lot of people are left kind of like, uh-huh, okay, like, I mean, it makes sense. I can't like argue against it logically, but for some reason, I'm not finding it compelling. Uh, and again, that reason I think is they're missing uh, their real apprehension. They're missing the way this, these ideas uh, have a real purchase upon their life. Okay, another way to uh, draw this distinction is just by comparing two works of art on these two theologians. So, on one side, you've got St. Augustine, whose heart is restless or animated by a love for truth. And it's that love for truth that, as it were, is enkindling his mind. So his mind is kind of activated, his intellectual life is animated by this uh, desire of his heart, his, this integral uh, experience of his longing for God. And on the other side, you have a picture of Aquinas, um, who by comparison seems much more sober. Um, he's listing out on his hands, perhaps the five ways or perhaps his five next uh, objections or, or five arguments he's going to make or some set of distinctions. It's um, again, sort of a different idea uh, of, of theology here. Okay, the next way I would like to distinguish between the monastics and the scholastics is with the help of a historian of theology, Jean Leclerc. Jean Leclerc was 
a very famous Benedictine in the 20th century. And he's largely responsible for the fact that we speak about monastic theology as a specific body of literature. Uh, his book, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God, uh, was it was seminal work just justifying um, this, uh, this, this nomenclature. That is, it, next to scholastic theology, you can also speak of monastic theology. And not all theology is scholastic theology. So in this pioneering work, um, we can look at a few of the things that Leclerc draws out to try to contrast these two theological cultures. The first is that monastic theology assumes a special way of life or a commitment. Uh, the monastic theologian is writing to an audience that is very much part of a specific community. The monastic theologian can take things for granted. Um, you can think he's writing a letter, a pastoral letter or a homily to people that he knows shares his presuppositions about the spiritual life. By contrast, the scholastic theologian is much more open in his instruction. And, and the sources he's drawing from and the people he's writing to, he's even ready to dialogue with the non-believers. And so there's correspondingly much less of a demand for commitment before uh, engaging in that kind of dialogue. The monastic theologian is the genre of his theology is uh, predominantly a pastoral communication. So again, a letter or a homily or a meditation or a prayer he's writing. Uh, something that is of immediate importance for actual souls that he knows by name. And the scholastic theologian, by contrast, is his, the, the first genre is the sort of the oral style of the professional lecture, the, the disputed question, and the record of that in something like a summa. Um, this is not immediately pastoral. That is, you can pick up and read these things no matter who you are. Whereas the monks, you know, were addressing their letters to specific people. They were giving their homilies to specific congregations and churches. The monastic theologian appeals to scripture and to the fathers and the scholastic theologian also appeals to the philosophers or these authorities that um, transcended uh, confessional and religious uh, boundaries. The monastic theologian is aiming at a mystical goal uh, that is something like union or experience with God, uh, experience of God. So his goal is something explicitly spiritual. His, his goal is, is, to, is to be and feel and know in a new way, in a way that draws him closer to God. The scholastic theologian, by contrast, aims, uh, at least most directly, at something like a comprehensive science. So he's trying to set in relation all the different propositions uh, that go into the doctrine of the faith and explain their relationships and defend them and so forth, trying to map out a comprehensive system. Um, I would also say that uh, it seems to me, at least, that the scholastic theologian is also aiming at a metaphysical insight. So um, there is something, I think, profound about the way uh, they do philosophy, at least somebody like an Aquinas or a Bonaventure. Uh, the monastic theologian, uh, his, his uh, culture is very literary. Um, it's, uh, it's got a lot of rhetoric and grammar involved in it. Uh, so you need to um, be able to immerse yourself in a particular grammar. You need to be open to being moved affectively to apprehend in a more integral way the truth that's being presented to you. Uh, and by contrast, the scholastic theologian is, is more dialectical. Uh, not that the monastic isn't dialectical or isn't interested in logic, but the scholastic theologian is sort of more unilaterally interested in that. And uh, the role of rhetoric is, is, not, um, is not strong in scholastic theology. And then finally, Leclerc points out that uh, the monastic theologian is promoting a kind of disinterested culture or the theology springs from a disinterested culture that is from the leisure of the contemplative life where there's not a specific practical goal to achieve. Uh, we're just here trying to contemplate, know and love God. Whereas the scholastic theologian is very interested in clerical formation, you know, the formation of the new uh, teachers in the Dominican order, say, um, or informing people who would go out and be able to uh, counter the heretics and so be able to write an apologia and defend the faith and again interested in building up uh, the system. Okay, so um, after this, um, you know, distinction between the two, I want to affirm very strongly what Leclerc himself also tries to affirm, um, although one can, you know, debate whether he does so successfully, 
namely that we really shouldn't exaggerate the differences between these two theologies, that ultimately these are two complementary aspects, Leclerc would say, of a unified theological method. And I think that really should be obvious because Augustine, the great patristic and monastic author, is also very logical. He also is very dialectical. And Aquinas is also existentially engaged, even if his restless heart is not so obvious, uh, given the specific genre of his writings. Just read his prayers and you'll find that uh, he is very much engaged with heart. Uh, um, and ultimately, as I transition now to kind of the second part of my uh, presentation, I want to argue that we really shouldn't feel like we have to choose between these two theologies. That again, they really are two aspects of a genuinely Catholic theological method. Um, I think, however, that today we are by habit probably more attuned to the scholastic moment in theology and less attentive to the essential monastic moment. And what do I mean by that? Well, today, um, culturally, I think in intellectual discourse, we try to pretend to a kind of objectivity that obscures our person as much as possible. We really don't like it when our own subjectivity enters into the, to the argument. Uh, we tend to see that automatically as a weakness. And so whether we're being authentic or inauthentic, we're always trying to hide the role that our life, our commitments, our particular worldview plays in shaping the intellectual discourse that we're engaged in. We try to hide all that and to pretend that everything can be resolved in this kind of objective sphere. Um, and I think that's a temptation of somebody who um, is, is, is immersed in a unilateral way in the scholastic form of theology and not attentive to the restless heart that really animates that theological method. Another is the, uh, the, the cultural value that we place on uh, logic and dialectic. So um, I've never met anybody who wanted to be a good philosopher or theologian or think rationally uh, say that uh, logic is, is fundamentally a bad thing, um, that we shouldn't try to be logical in our thinking. Um, I have met, however, many people who are very suspicious of the role of rhetoric in argument. Rhetoric is something that we immediately think in a pejorative sense. Um, we like our arguments to be very kind of cold and, and we think sober. And the second they start to become rhetorical is the second we feel like someone is trying to sell me something by manipulating me. Um, and so we, we don't like rhetoric. But in antiquity, rhetoric was not, uh, I mean, of course, it could be abused in that way. But fundamentally, it was a very positive art. It was something to cultivate. It made you um, hopefully not a con man, but hopefully a great orator who can help move a crowd to apprehend in a way where they do something in accordance to the truth that you're presenting to them. And so rhetoric was essential and in argument precisely in order to cultivate this integral response to the truth we're apprehending. And I think today, again, our unilateral immersion in the kind of scholastic way of thinking has us thinking very negatively um, about rhetoric. And finally, I think that um, we, uh, again, sort of default to the scholastic mode in as much as the principal locus of philosophy and theology today um, is, is the university. And it's a university system that arguably is increasingly secularized. Um, and, and even in institutions that are, are, are religiously affiliated, um, it's it, oftentimes you can have these little battles about, you know, how religiously affiliated are we going to be and how confessional are we, are we going to allow um, a theology department, for example. So uh, these are three ways in which I think that today you can argue, I think, that um, we need to recover the monastic moment um, uh, for the sake of, of theology. Okay, uh, and to make my case now, the importance of recovering that monastic moment um, for the success of theology and also for the success of scholastic theology, I want to uh, draw attention to St. Anselm of Canterbury. And in many ways, I think he's a, really the perfect figure to help make this argument because uh, he lives in, a, in the 11th century, he dies in 1109, and he's often called a father of scholasticism. That is in the history of theology, people look to him as a pre-scholastic and as somebody who in many ways anticipated the rising scholastic culture and contributed to it. Um, and there's reason for this, there's reason for this. So 
Um, he was familiar at least with the old logic of Aristotle, so he didn't have access to the new logic, but he, did, he quotes Aristotle. Um, he has uh, lots of works and where his penchant for dialectics comes out very clearly. Many passages that look very sober uh, and collected or cool or um, texts that could look just like an Aquinas. Uh, he structures some of his works with a table of contents and a chapter division. So he's, he's starting perhaps to think very systematically. And so there's good reason to think of him as a father of scholasticism. However, he also wrote many prayers, dialogues, letters, and homilies, and so forth. And uh, he, then right next to those passages that are, are clearly dialectical in character, there are so many passages that are intensely Augustinian, that are, are filled with passion and the, the pathos of the monk that is, uh, that, that is, I would argue, and I'm going to argue here, integral to understanding uh, his argument. Okay, Anselm, um, in many ways, therefore, kind of combines the two millenniums that we're talking about, the, the sort of the monastic patristic millennium, and then the subsequent scholastic millennium. And so I would argue that, yes, let's call him a father of scholasticism, as 99% as of the secondary literature does, but I think we should also be calling him a son of monasticism, if we want to understand his theology um, uh, as, as best we can. Um, and I think that because he's kind of a bridge figure, uh, it makes him very special um, as a really synthetic or integral theologian. And I don't think, therefore, it's any coincidence that one of the most famous statements about theological method that we have uh, was penned by St. Anselm, namely of theology as faith-seeking understanding. Um, okay, so to, to make my case, the text I want to focus on is the proslogion. Uh, and in particular, his argument for God's existence in the Proslogion. There's some debate out there in the literature about this work and this argument in particular. Is it just a pious meditation meant to be read by monks who are already persuaded of God's existence, but kind of want an emotional boost as they think and love God? And so they want to read this pious kind of um, emotionally saturated work in order to drum up their their emotions uh, with love for God. Or is it a rigorous demonstration? That is, is the kind of monastic element of it sort of um, unimportant, and it offers a very strong argument for God uh, that can stand up. Uh, I would like to suggest, uh, you could probably imagine, given the way this presentation has gone, that can it be both? I think so. So I think it can be both a monastic and a scholastic text. That is, it can be filled with piety and it can be filled with rigor, and thus it can reveal the harmony of these two theological cultures, the monastic and the scholastic, in a unified theological method. Okay, so the standard or the usual in a presentation of Anselm's argument for God's existence in the Proslogion focuses on three chapters, Proslogion two through four. The Proslogion has 26 chapters, um, but most people, when they're trying to present his argument, they focus on chapters two through four. And these are, you could say, the most scholastic chapters. That is, these are the chapters that uh, clearly show Anselm's penchant for dialectics. Uh, they're very discursive, um, and they kind of lay out the objective analysis that, that, uh, that offers the argument. Scholars ignore the first chapter, which is this spiritually saturated um, chapter that really sets the stage for everything that follows. And I think that's a critical mistake because in reading chapter one, we can follow Anselm in his monastic introspection to realize what he's actually talking about when he's trying to search for God. And that's essential as I'll argue in a moment. But before I argue that, I want to set the stage by presenting the usual presentation of the argument and then showing how the monastic moment can deepen that presentation of the argument. Ultimately, I, I don't want to just dismiss the usual presentation. I want to try to deepen it by embedding it within the context that Anselm himself gave it in. So the usual presentation first. Uh, God is said to be defined conceptually as that than which nothing greater can be thought. And so to deny God now, I have to deny that than which nothing greater can be thought. To deny that than which nothing greater can be thought, I must first understand it. That is, if I'm going to deny X, I first have to have X in my mind, in my understanding. I must understand what I'm denying 
or else the profession of a denial really doesn't mean anything quite literally. So I must understand that then which nothing greater can be thought if I'm ever going to deny it. But if it is in my understanding, if that then which nothing greater can be thought is in, in my understanding for me to be able to deny it, it must also be in reality or else it would not at all be that then which nothing greater can be thought. Because what exists also in reality is gonna be greater than what exists only in my understanding. And so if I'm really understanding that, that which nothing greater can be thought, I must be thinking something that also exists in reality. For if it did not also exist in reality, I could understand something greater than it, namely something that exists both in understanding and in reality. And thus that which I was trying to think in order to deny would not in fact be what I'm trying to deny. So God therefore, or that then which nothing greater can be thought must therefore exist in my understanding and in reality. Thus goes the, the, the basic form of the argument. In order to try to poke a hole or open a door in this presentation of the argument in order to show the importance of the monastic moment or the spiritual context within which it's presented, I want to uh, take issue with um, two points here. And those are the points in red. So it, uh, scholars often say that Anselm defines God as that than which nothing greater can be thought. And I think, uh, you know, it depends on what you mean by defined, but I think as the word defined is usually understood, it, it cripples the argument because Anselm does not think that we can define God. He's quite explicit in the monologue on that we don't know God per se. We only know him per aliud, he says. And so he's not reaching um, the essence of God and therefore deducing out of God's essence his necessary existence. Um, that's just not what he's doing. Uh, I would say that, as we'll see in a moment, he is naming something in the landscape of his spiritual experience. He's naming this, that then which nothing greater can be thought, uh, that which measures all the greatness that he does think. He's just calling that God. He's sort of apprehending that thing, which allows his intellectual life to get off the ground as the, a sort of hierarchical ranking between the just, the unjust, the true, the false, the great, the greater, you know, that transcendent greatness than which nothing greater can be thought. And that allows him to rank all the things he can think. Um, he's just naming that as God uh, rather than defining God uh, in a way that tries to capture him in a static essence. So that's, that's, that, that is going to be the first sort of door. What, what is, how is it that he's naming God? That's, that's going to be the way I try to argue for the importance of the monastic moment. And then a corresponding point, which one I can't get into uh, given the length of time, is that this changes or at least makes very precise what Anselm means by the word intelligere or to understand. What does it mean to have God in intellectu or in the understanding? It certainly means more than possessing an abstract concept of him. Um, and if I were to make that argument, we'd, we'd uh, look at some fun texts from the De Grammatico uh, that he wrote, the Monologion, uh, the philosophical fragments he wrote, and then certainly also his reply to Gaunilo, who made objections against the Proslogion. Okay, but the, the focus of, that I'm going to have is, is on this uh, idea of, of naming God as, as part of a spiritual landscape. Okay. So here are my notes here. So this I think is, is very important um, that we return to the spiritual context because otherwise we won't know what Anselm is in fact talking about. Um, it's in Proslogion 1 that he goes into himself, that he has a very introspective experience. And then he's trying to tutor the reader to follow him in, in order to be able to see what he's talking about when he searches for God. This is no spaghetti monster or Superman or magical tooth fairy arranging the planets. This is a reality of total existential import um, that uh, has everything to do with the coherence of his own life and mind, just like for Augustine. Okay, so the, this first chapter is very long and very beautiful, um, and obviously I can't present the whole of it. And there are, there are, I think, at least three points that one could draw out of here that show um, just how existentially significant this first chapter is, and therefore just how important it is for helping us determine what God means to him, and therefore what we're searching for in the rest of the Proslogion. But I only focus on one of those points, and it's this expression he uses at the very beginning, vacare deo. 
Um, so let me read now this, this opening of the, of the first chapter and then make a comment. Quick now, little man, flee a short while your occupations. Hide yourself a short time from your tumultuous thoughts. Cast off your burdensome cares now and put off until later your laborious distresses. Empty a little bit for God. Be free a little bit for God. This is the Vacara Deo. And rest a little bit in him. Enter into the chamber of your mind. Close off all things besides God and what may help you in seeking him. And with door closed, seek him. Speak now my whole heart. Speak now to God. I seek your countenance. Your countenance, O Lord, I seek again. So in this beautiful text filled with rhetoric, I think we come to understand, hopefully, if we're able to follow Anselm, just what it is we're searching for. We're searching for, you could say it, I guess, using the philosopher's language of the absolute, you know, the thing that relativizes everything else in my life, that which is worthy of me emptying everything else except for him and what could allow me to search for him. We're looking for the one who has the right to command the attention of my whole heart, this whole heart to speak to him. And so we're not looking for any one little thing. We're looking for the one who has a right to my whole. This means then that what Anselm is talking about here in this vacare day or this be free for God is not just you know, trying to find a little more time in our day to sit down and read a good book um, or to put off some you know, paying our bills or whatever in order to pray for 30 minutes or something. It's not about time or finding the right book or something. It's about finding the interior freedom to detach from all those relative things in order to be open to what alone is truly absolute. Now, that's a, you know, so to speak, a dangerous thing because that is a kind of quest that is intensely moral before it's intellectual. Is something that demands that kind of detachment, that interior freedom, before I can even embark on searching for what Anselm is talking about when he talks about God. That's something we can't take for granted. That requires a certain kind of commitment. Uh, Jean Danielus, when he was talking about you know, what it means to know God, he spoke of that as kind of a limit problem, because to truly know God, you have to be open to total conversion. God is not something you can know and then be indifferent to. He's the one who has a command on, on our allegiance. Once we recognize him, it's like, holy smokes, I saw the king. And now I know myself as a subject. I saw the absolute and I know myself as contingent. This is not, again, a neutral thing. And it demands a certain kind of life, a certain moral disposition before the intellectual quest can really take off. And so the real question in the first chapter of the Proslogion is sort of, do you want to see God? Uh, you better ask yourself that question before you go looking for him. You know, don't kid yourself and run off to the races trying to find God when in your heart of hearts, you're not interested in seeing him. If you want to find him, you've got to be ready to, 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 to find him because it's, it's quite a powerful experience. <laughs> Um, okay, so what kind of life is necessary to find God? Well, uh, before we look at that, let me just, you know, sort of summarize this, this transition here. Searching for God intellectually is connected to searching for him in our lives. And thus, Anselm insists, speak now my whole heart, not just the speculative portion of my mind. And so what kind of life must we live if we're really or actually going to apprehend or understand that then which nothing greater can be thought in a real concrete way? And what kind of heart is going to seek and worship that reality? That is, give it the name of God, the one before whom it sacrifices all other things. Well, um, Anselm himself in his biography, uh, being a saint, I think offers a wonderful example. And so we'll use him. Uh, and also some of the uh, pastoral advice that he gave to, to Christians in the world. Um, one of my favorite uh, little facts about Anselm's biography uh, written by a contemporary A. Admer, is that he says that Anselm was a boy raised among the mountains. Um, and in a very beautiful way, he suggests that the kind of life that Anselm lived 
was the life of a boy among the mountains. That is somebody who's always climbing higher. Anselm A. Edmer reports, even had this dream of ascending the mountain and meeting God at the top and receiving the Eucharist from him. So uh, to, to make a long story short, the kind of life that we're talking about here, the kind of life that is suited to seeking God is the kind of life that is looking for greatness in all things, that is ready to ascend. So um, I will ground that in a particular text. So he wrote a letter to a widow named Basilia. This is letter 420 in his corpus. Um, and in this, he describes life as a constant ascent. He says that a Christian man and a Christian woman should consider carefully in each of their desires or actions, whether they are ascending or descending, and they should embrace with their whole heart those things in which they see themselves ascending. Now, here's an important transition to the intellectual life. Anselm understands reason precisely as the organ that enables this ascent, that is this journey towards the ever greater. He says in the Monologian that for the rational nature, there is no difference between being rational and being able to discern the just from what is not just, the true from what is not true, the good from what is not good, and the greater good from the lesser good. But this ability is altogether useless for it and utterly empty unless it loves or repudiates what it discerns in accordance with the judgment of a true discernment. So reason is, is, is serving life in as much as it's allowing the heart to choose the greater, to ascend, and uh, in, in order to enjoy a, you know, a, fuller, um, a fuller delight in, in what is good, what is true, and what is just, and so forth. And for Anselm, the kind of life that is most committed to that ascent is for him the monastic life. And here's a text I found in another letter that I have seen quoted in only one or two articles, but which for me was so provocative when I first found it. Um, namely, in letter 121, he calls the monastic commitment the life than which one cannot have a greater. And that, uh, that phrase in the English and in the Latin it seems to me is such a clear allusion to his name for God as that than which nothing greater can be thought. Um, and there are other texts we can get into to, to sort of, you know, uncover his understanding of monastic life. But here, I just want to say that it, for him, it's, it's, you know, it's the kind of life in which one cannot have a greater because it's the kind of life that is totally dedicated explicitly in every thought and action and moment of, of, of temporal existence dedicated to the ascent, to discerning the true over the false, the just over the unjust, the greater over the lesser, and following through on it. That's the kind of life that is going to deepen your apprehension of that transcendent summit that's always calling you higher. If you live in a way that uh, betrays this kind of life, then um, your apprehension of, of the summit is going to be correspondingly weaker. Newman also makes this point in, in the grammar of ascent that you know, the, the more we uh, sort of betray our conscience, um, the, the, the weaker our apprehension of God can become. But the more we follow through on its discernment, the more we follow through and will uh, what the reason determines to be the true course, um, the stronger that apprehension gets. And that makes sense because this transcendent greatness is the measuring rod of all that discernment. And so if you're measuring um, of course, you're more sensitive to the measuring rod that you're using. Okay, uh, really quickly, just uh, final slides here, just to make this point another way, um, using some quotations from St. Gregory the Great, also a monastic author. So St. Gregory the Great says that, for such truly are the hearts of men, which by the nature of noble reason leap to the heights. So he's saying that by nature, just like Anselm is saying, uh, reason leaps to the heights. That is, reason is always looking for the transcendently great and trying to guide us in a kind of hierarchical way to find the true, the good, the beautiful, and so forth. Um, and so here's kind of like, you know, that gold line is that transcendent horizon within which I'm able to judge uh, by reason all the different great things. But, St. Gregory the Great says, when pride lifts up our mind, piercing love for what is highest immediately falls away from us. And no longer loving, no longer preferring that absolute transcendent greatness to everything else, no longer being willing to be relativized in all my actions, thoughts, and therefore docile and obedient to the transcendent greatness, in losing that piercing love for what is highest, 
um, uh, th then I, I now look to myself as the highest measure of things. And thus, it's, it's quite obvious that uh, God sort of, my apprehension of him uh, weakens and, and uh, I am no longer reasoning in the light of, of his transcendent greatness. Okay, so uh, uh, to, to close the kind of life that um, I suggest we need to live in order to be good theologians, uh, is a life that combines both the monastic and the scholastic. That is, that uh, has that restless heart that is on the journey uh, towards the transcendent summit. Um, and it's in living that kind of life, that living faith, seeking understanding, that we'll be able to enter into most powerfully uh, the scholastic texts as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Father. We, uh, we are truly in your debt. That was uh, both fascinating and, and also very inspiring um, with, that, with that final challenge. Now, we have a whole host of questions, uh, which is absolutely wonderful. I would like to start off um, with this question from Abhishek Raj. Um, it's really the, the Monte Cassino question about the, the relationship between these two. And if you could, Abhishek, if you could uh, just unmute yourself, we'll let you ask your question live. Well, uh, my name is Abhishek and uh, I'm, I'm in the path of being Catholic. So, so I'm learning, I'm inquiring, I'm examining everything. So my question is, that can we say that monastic theology sustains and nurture scholastic theology to continue and expand? Thank yes. you. Yes, to, 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 to be very simple, absolutely. So um, this is not something I can defend in any kind of comprehensive way. I'm, I'm still very young and, and there's so many things I need to read, but <laughs> uh, I think that people uh, who read a lot of Thomas um, for example, uh, know just how immersed he is in the tradition. And if you want to understand his vocabulary, the, you know, this great scholastic theologian, you have to be familiar with the church fathers and, and the medieval monks. Um, and so I think there's so much grammar work, so much time spent in the living tradition uh, that comes before Thomas that helps make Thomas himself accessible. It's not enough to be a man of intense logical ability. There is also necessary kind of like a, a, a homework of, of reading the tradition before him in order to understand the meaning of his terms. And so I would, I would wholeheartedly say a yes to your question. Thank you. Um, Glenn uh, Lewandowski, if you're there with us and you wanna unmute yourself, um, go ahead. So I, I asked a number of questions. Did you have one in mind that I should uh, focus on? So your second one, I thought, was, uh, was particularly helpful for us. So uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I am a canon regular, not a monk, and I am attracted to the history of the monastic theology. And uh, I want to ask, do you have or promote a list of the top 20 must read books to get a quick elemental grasp of this is what we mean by monastic theology. And who is writing monastic theology today that you would pinpoint as, yes, this is it. Yes, this is good, read it. Hmm. Um, that's a very reasonable question. <laughs> And um, I don't think I'm going to have a very satisfying answer to it. So um, I, uh, so I think for sure you've got to read Jean Leclerc if you want to get into what is monastic theology. Um, and then you know if if I were if I were to have prepared better to answer this particular question, I would have reviewed the bibliography I have on my dissertation because I've got a lot of other authors of French and Italian. Um, uh, who are really good about this. If you want, uh, we can find a way to give you my email or something and I can give you some good titles. But there's a lot of written about monastic theology, particularly in French and Italian, um, that, that at least that I'm aware of. Uh, there may be also other languages. I don't think a lot has been written in English on this. There are some monastic scholars 
um, some Trappist authors um, uh, that, that one could read, but they're typically monks uh, 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 in this. Um, and I, I, it doesn't seem to me that in English uh, scholarship, monastic theology has gotten a very strong reception. Um, as for like who today is like actually doing monastic theology in a way, um, I, you know, I have to be humble and, and just say that like, I, I don't really know because I don't feel like I've read that much that I would really say, there's the lodestar, let's follow him. When I want good monastic theology, I just go back to Anselm and Bernard and Gregory the Great and Augustine. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced, and it could just be my relative youth and, and, and lack of, of reading, uh, but I'm not convinced that we've really done this successfully. Uh, some people, when they're trying to do monastic theology, what they say is monastic theology, sometimes do it in a way that uh, carries a disdain for the scholastic theology. You know, there is this temptation, I think sometimes even in Leclerc himself, to um, defend the monks in a way that kind of diminishes the great scholastics. Um, and that, that's not, I, I don't think that's ultimately uh, the way to go forward. Um, uh, so I think some, you know, some of the great monks and church fathers are ultimately where I would want to go right now. But that doesn't mean there isn't anybody out there. I'm just young and relatively uh, unread. Father John, I'm going to take this chance to uh, exert my dominance here. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, a few of these questions raise, raise the, the, the question of institutions, right? Uh, so, so some of the questions reference uh, your education at, at a Jesuit institution, but we could even think more broadly uh, about what it would mean to do monastic theology, given that most theologians uh, aren't in monasteries, at least uh, quite a few of us, right? There's universities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are the prospects for, for doing the types of things you're asking us to do in a context that's different? Mm -hmm. um, so how, how do we go about doing monastic theology in a different context? Um, okay, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, um, but I'm also seeing here, I definitely want to get to Mark Barrett's question at some point, um, and maybe you're also planning to send me in that direction as well, um, about Aquinas' read on the Prostologia. But um, okay, so I think that uh, this is in many ways the million dollar question. Um, I met my half kid, that is, I'm not saying that everybody has to go enter a canonical religious order in order to become a monastic uh, theologian in the kind that I think is necessary. What is essential is that people have an authentic spiritual life. And so I think that that means that uh, we're much more honest in our thought. That is that we, we sort of are willing to say that like, yeah, man, like I believe in truth. And I think that all things, uh, all really existing things participate in truth. And I'm interested in the fullness of truth. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not after a solution that I can render to myself conceptually transparent. I'm looking at that truth that embraces it all. And so I'm looking for something that's necessarily mysterious, that's going to master me, that I'm not mastered by. And so the fundamental disposition in my intellectual life is of openness, humility, faith. And I'm just going to be straightforward about that, you know, and not go into the lecture hall or go into my dissertation defense or whatever, pretending like I have really mastered this. And so I think a certain authenticity in the intellectual life is important. And that authenticity will, will just shoot you to prayer if, if, you, if you follow its dynamic. You know, you will have to be immediately thinking about like, holy smokes, like I can't control all this. Like I'm not going to be able to guarantee that I'm getting to the right answer. You know, so I, what, what's the coherence of my intellectual life then at that point? It hangs on this keystone of like providence and the loving friend and liberator of human beings who created all things and wants to guide my life too. So uh, being willing to, to pray and to take seriously the discernment of your own intellectual life. Maybe to be really concrete, I'm sure anybody who likes books has a gazillion of them. And one of the most difficult things is like, how do I make my way through that list? You know, how do I, what, which book am I gonna buy? Which book am I gonna read next? Um, that's, a, that's a big problem for, for a lot of people. And I think that um, a, a way to become a monastic theologian is to really take that to prayer and to be willing to see that discernment as a genuine, as a moment of prayer. Like, am I going for this book just because, you know, uh, my pride wants me to be able to, you know, tell everybody that I've really mastered this book or that I'm, you know, really good on so many authors, you know, or, or am, I, am I really wanting this book because, hey, this corresponds to an actual question I have. Um, another thing that comes to my mind is publishing, but th this, this is, 
this is hard because I think that um, the intellectual culture in which we live of academia is in many ways set against this effort because a lot of people, you know, they, they want to pray, like they want to be authentic in their intellectual lives, but they have to pump out these, you know, the seemingly original works every six months or so. And maybe other people do, but I don't have that many original thoughts. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm lucky if I get a couple. And so it's like, it's, it's not often that I feel like I need to grab the megaphone and say something. Um, but a, a lot of times our academic culture demands that of us, which is kind of inauthentic. And so um, I don't know how to solve that problem because we want people to get jobs and to advance at in, in these institutions. Um, but maybe in different points, they could be part of, uh, of a little push toward a more authentic culture. And maybe the last thing I'll say is, is cultivating genuine community and friendship around these things. So, um, you know, the, the humility that we need for the intellectual quest is not just a private affair because the intellectual quest is not just a private affair. You know, we need to be plugged into a past and a present and a future. And so uh, we need a, a kind of safe network of friendships before whom we can be humble and, and acknowledge our, our, our real questions and, and be willing to learn from. So I think finding uh, communities like that is essential for this. Um, and there I've, I've sort of named like some of the keynotes of monastic life, right? And so there's like the, you know, spiritual discernment and prayer, and there's the authenticity of the spiritual life, and there's community. So um, I think those would be some, some of the things that, that I'd mention. Thank you. Um, why don't we let Mark Barrett ask his, his question, if you want to turn on your microphone. He actually said, and I'm seeing now in the chat, oh. he said, I would rather my question be read by someone else. Perfect. Okay, I'll ask it. And then I can sound smart like Mark Barrett, too. Uh, <laughs> given your examples of the topic tonight, uh, what do you make of Aquinas's rejection of the ontological argument? Do you personally find Anselm's construction of it to be convincing? Wonderful. Uh, in many ways, I, uh, I sort of left this door wide open, I think, uh, by my presentation. I'm so glad somebody took it because it allows me to make a number of additional points um, that I think are, in fact, relevant. Uh, the first is that this argument of Anselm often goes by the name the ontological argument, which is a, a nomenclature that comes from Kant and his reading and dismissal of the argument. Um, and so a lot of uh, contemporary uh, discourse about Anselm is sort of handicapped, in my opinion, by this Kantian reading of the argument. I don't think it's the ontological argument. Um, However, Aquinas, even before Kant, does seem to have a reading that looks similar. Um, and, and namely this, that uh, ultimately he, the, the accusation is that Anselm is going from the, the order of concepts to the order of reality. That is, he has this abstract essential definition and he's arguing that there must be something of that kind. Um, I think an analogy could be something like, I could know the definition of a triangle uh, without there, in fact, ever being any perfect triangles out there in reality. So you can't jump from a concept to the reality. Uh, the whole question is whether or not there is, in fact, in reality, anything that corresponds to your definition. Um, so uh, th this, this argument, uh, this dismissal of the ontological argument or the attempt to jump from the conceptual to the real um, is in Kant, but it could be also in a form in Aquinas. Now, here's what I would say about Aquinas's treatment of Anselm. The first is that um, this reading that Aquinas has of the Proslogion is limited to chapters two through four. Uh, so he's, he's at, at, by all appearances, commenting on some kind of excerpt um, of the argument uh, that was put in some sort of, you know, textbook reader, I guess, uh, for topics on God. Um, the second point I want to make is that Aquinas's reading on this is embroiled in a larger dispute between Franciscans and Dominicans about whether or not God's existence is self-evident. Now, this argument of Anselm, chapters two through four, I don't think can be used uh, and marshaled in order to say that God's existence is self-evident. And I think that's what Aquinas is targeting uh, in particular. Um, and... Uh, so ultimately, I think he's not dealing with Anselm's argument, and because Anselm never presented these two through four as something that should be abstracted from the whole. Um, and number two, Anselm never claims that God's existence is self-evident. This is uh, a genuine argument that he's working. 
And the final point I'll make in this regard is that I actually think that Aquinas's form of argument in the five ways is in an important way very similar to Anselm's. And uh, here's what I mean by that. I said before that Anselm is uh, beginning with chapter one because he's, he's trying to help us see what you name as God. You know, what, what am I calling God? I'm calling God that then which nothing greater can be thought. You know, that, that in my spiritual horizon, which allows my reason to go between the just and the unjust and so forth. It's not defining God. It's naming God as that. That's exactly how Aquinas does his five ways, so far as I read them. And after each way, after each argument for the existence of God, he ends with, and that's what all men call God. And so I think Aquinas, too, is, is proceeding in a similar fashion. That is, he's sort of looking into our spiritual landscape or the coherence of reason. Um, and, and saying, you know, that which makes that possible, I'm calling that God. Uh, and so ultimately, I think they're, they're far more compatible um, than a lot of secondary literature um, would claim right now. So I hope that helps. Very much so. Very much so. Um, Chris Armstrong raised this question. Um, Augustine, he says, spoke in his day as a rhetorical teacher of those days. He spoke. Uh, as uh, he said, he called himself a vendor of words, right? So he was a vendor of words. This is very negative. Um, and I, the question, I think, is how to reconcile that critique of rhetoric with the affirmation of rhetoric in the monastic theology, because I think there's a way to do it that would be helpful for understanding what true monastic theology is. Yeah. Um, so I would wonder uh, when it is that Augustine calls himself a vendor of words, and I have a hunch that's when he's sort of criticizing his past life as a teacher of rhetoric, uh, somebody who was just giving people the power to persuade uh, even of false things. So, you know, helping the lawyers uh, do their negative lawyer thing. Um, I don't think Augustine uh, uh, meant to dismiss um, the beautiful speech as such. Um, you know, like, I don't think, so St. Bernard is, you know, the honey-tongued preacher. Um, I don't think that he would have criticized St. Bernard for his honey tongue. Because, I mean, Augustine himself had such a tongue and he never disowned it entirely. But if we're using rhetoric to persuade people of the false, uh, if we're being manipulative like that, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's terrible. Um, and, you know, a seller of words in that sense, you know, a teacher of rhetoric who's selling people the power to manipulate that's negative and you know, that is not something that's laudable and I don't think that's what the monastic tradition is aiming for. What they are aiming for is the ar arousal of our passions in a way that corresponds to the truth of things. So just for example, like, I mean, if, you know, if, if I walked by a, a homeless person dying on the street and just walked by and was not moved interiorly there's something wrong, something missing. I need somebody to come here and say, Father John, what's the matter with you? That man is human like you. And I need that person to like use all the rhetoric he's got to help me see the reality in front of me. And I think there are so many things like that uh, where we're just not attentive with the kind of integrity that we ought to be, that we ought to have. And the monks were aware of this. They knew the spiritual life was hard. You had to rouse people up and stir them. You know, they, they were committed, they knew what they believed, and, they, you know, it wasn't about persuading them of the truth or the falsity of that in this moment, but it was about helping them with their whole heart, you know, to, to recognize and, and enter into the truth uh, that they believe. That's, that's really the form of a lot of Anselm's prayers. So his prayers are beautiful, and they are filled with rhetoric and also with very uh, strong conceptual clarity. But his program in there is, is sort of rousing the mind and the heart uh, to the reality of God. Uh, now, this is uh, from an anonymous attendee. Uh, the question about the Eastern Church and their tradition. Uh, do you think it's possible that they've more effectively extended this uh, monastic theological tradition? Um, into a dialogue with scholastic theology. I don't know so much about an explicit dialogue, uh, but that whether, whether that tradition is maybe more, more realized in a way that's helpful for us thinking about our engagement with, with scholasticism. It could be. So I, I have to admit a lot of ignorance here. Um, from the little I do know, uh, 
My understanding is that the Eastern Church initially had a hard time uh, reconciling with scholasticism. There were different elements within the Eastern Church um, that did embrace, uh, but then they weren't always very highly favored by, by um, the Orthodox culture. Um, so there is some ambiguity vis-a-vis uh, -vis scholasticism in the Eastern tradition. But in as much as they held on to uh, a mystical vision for theology, uh, that's going to be helpful. Um, but if that mystical vision, um, d d you know, excludes the natural tendency of the mind to distinguish and to, and to, you know, explore conceptually, then it's not going to be helpful. I think that uh, there is something very natural and organic in, in the tradition and the way we kind of go, went from rhetoric to grammar to logic uh, in the church fathers and the monks and the scholastics. And um, I think that that sort of corresponds to the trajectory of the mind itself. Um, and we wouldn't want to short circuit that. Uh, the, life needs, the life of the mind needs to be allowed to explore like that. And so if the Eastern Church is, uh, and I'm, I'm, I mean, it's obviously spiritually incredibly rich. Uh, and I mean, I would profit immensely if I knew it better than I do, I'm sure. Um, in the measure that they're holding on to that spiritual life and deepening it, and at the same time, integrating scholasticism into it, uh, then I think it would be a, a great boon. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Father. I think we are fast approaching our time. So I would like to, to just thank you so much for this wonderful, um, wonderful talk and this, these great answers to these questions. Um, I would like to, to encourage our listeners. Um, you'll be having a survey uh, coming through your email. Please fill those out. They'll help us to know uh, how we can improve and how to make sure we keep doing things right, like having uh, Father John Beyer uh, speak for us. And uh, also, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the St. Benedict Institute, and Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture at the University of Dallas. Thank you, Father John Beyer, for, for taking the time. Any of you here who would uh, like to get a little bit more, um, Father John's book is coming out with Brill in October of this year, so um, you, can, you can look it up. Um, the Unity of the Proslogion. Correct? Yes. Um, beyond that, um, please share our materials with your friends, with your, your family, uh, even with your not friends and not family. Um, and if you've enjoyed your work, our work tonight, uh, please do support us. Uh, you can make a contribution at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Uh, thank you and have a wonderful night. Bye. Thank you.